Welcome to the party. I'm Sam Ekstrom of Locked On Sports Minnesota. Is Sam Darnold the next Geno Smith? That's the title of the show. That's all I could come up with. Sam brought a lot of energy to that cold open. I've got nothing. <laughs> My name is Arif from the Wide Left Substack. And uh, I guess the takeaway from the owners' meetings is that the Vikings might be interested in the quarterback. <laughs> Luke Inman at Luke underscore Spinman. The Vikings have the best owners in the world. The Timberwolves, on the other hand, not so much. And I'm Luke Braun of Locked On Vikings, and my co-hosts have absolutely no idea how close they got to being invited to my wedding. Locked On Sports Minnesota Podcast. It's endless Minnesota Vikings talk with the diverse voices of your local experts. It's time for the Minnesota Football Party. It's your- Can we get an idea? Just a just a hint. Yeah, I, I want to closer know. than Alex Rodriguez got to buying the Timberwolves. Wow, wow. and he was at the finish line. Welcome wow. to the live God. edition of the yeah. Minnesota Football Party oh. on a Thursday. <laughs> Thank you for joining. We are all in agony <laughs> at coming that close to getting the invite. Um, oh. We dug our own graves. We've Could treated Luke Ron terribly. So many things. If we yeah, had just gotta... been a little more decent to our fellow co-host, um, yeah, I'm sure that was the line. And not, oh, it had nothing to do with that. It was yeah. a calendar, unfortunately. Backers These, uh, outside your control. This <laughs> ragtag band of podcasters would have made a great table. We would have been the life of the party. Um, but we are pretty good at bringing you Vikings talk Mondays and Thursdays on Locked On Sports Minnesota. Thanks for watching us. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel on which you are watching or listen to us, the Locked On Vikings audio feed, wherever you get your podcast. Luke Braun covers that uh, as well with his daily show, Locked On Vikings. Uh, on today's program, Sam Darnold. Are there comps for Sam Darnold historically? Can a quarterback of his caliber and i use caliber generously resurrect his career in a new location uh we'll talk about that in the league meeting some takeaway quotes after a 35 minute sit down uh with reporters and kevin o'connell and a chris thomason cameo well of course it's a pruder film that bad boy and uh, ron johnson joins from chicago today we've had him from mexico on a golf course we've had him from every other state in the union i think but uh We'll have him again today in his usual Thursday slot. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Uh, all right. Let's pay off the title tease for those that are already in the room. Thank you for joining us. Feel free to interact if you have questions. We'll try to get to those later in the show as well. Um, there's been a lot of support for Sam Darnold from the coaching staff. They're not they're not counting their chickens before they're hatched with the rookie quarterback. They're they're talking about Sam Darnold as if there's a lot of faith, a lot of hope, a lot of belief. It's not belief that I share. Um, are there comparisons for Sam Darnold historically of quarterbacks that were not just average, were not just slightly underachieving, but were pretty below average in their first home, who resurrected their career in a new location? Uh, I think there's maybe a couple modern examples you can point to. There's the Baker Mayfield example, but but Baker was not bad to the extent Sam Darnold was bad. I think Geno Smith is the obvious one, somebody who really tanked with the Jets, sat for a few years, and then kind of found his way back as a veteran with Seattle. Are there any other comps around the league of players who have done this successfully? Um, let's start with Luke Braun, host of Locked On Vikings. Give it to us. Uh, the Geno Smith one is the only one I can think of now. <laughs> and I, I don't think there's that many other options. Yeah, I don't think it, yeah. It's, it's like not something that happens often. I Yeah, I, I had to dig a little bit. Here's some guys that at least started slow that were first-round capital kind of guys. Ryan Tannehill, Jay Cutler, three losing seasons in Denver. Then he went to Chicago. Do we think Jay Cutler turned back. it around? Is that a thing? That no, we're... again, I told you, I, I had to dig. These, these, Yes, I, I went way back in the archives. Alex Smith was pretty average those first couple years. Number one overall pick. Average is generous. He was bad. 
Okay, uh, he was exactly. horrible with the Niners until yeah, yeah. the Harbaugh years. Yeah, yep. until the Harbaugh, until the Harbaugh years. years. Yep, yep. Uh, so, Drew Brees was okay the first couple of years, and then he mm-hmm. went to New Orleans. He had one. He had one winning season uh, with the Chargers, but not much. But that's all I so got. It was tough. I I went through uh, Stathead enough that I feel like I'm just going to turn this segment into a piece um, to to find all these comps to find people who did like really poorly early on, and I separated it into two categories: people who revived their careers with a different team, and people who uh, started getting better with the same team. So Drew Brees is actually a really good example. He actually was actually bad. I don't I, like. I think that you were being generous mm-hmm. to how he had started out with the San Diego Chargers, but he had revived his career uh, with the Chargers before the shoulder injury and then free agency uh, with the Saints. And so he so I think a lot of people might think he was generally all right with the Chargers and then turn it around with the Saints. But actually, his final two years, of the Chargers are quite good before that injury. Um, so uh, Alex Smith stands out. Ryan Tanhill stands out. Um, among same team quarterbacks, and you have to go way back because this happened a lot more often in the 70s than it does now, which I think is an important thing. But Steve Bartkowski, first overall pick for the Falcons, had three consecutive years below a 50% completion rate, which was still bad in the 70s. Um, Randall Cunningham and Donovan McNabb, both for the Eagles, actually uh, started out really poorly in their careers first three years. Uh, and then in major passing categories, turned it around really significantly. Phil Simms uh, was miserable mm. for five years, although yeah, that's a good one. Two, of those, two of those years were injury riddled. But yeah, it was pretty bad for like five years and then immediately uh, started leading the league in a bunch of categories after that. Terry Bradshaw, I think, is one of the best examples. Um, he was a guy drafted first overall by the Pittsburgh Steelers. His first five, the first five years of his, of his career were so bad that when he showed up to training camp, I think before his fifth season, which still wasn't even a good season, um, he was surprised to find out he was still on the roster. Um, like, that's how bad he was. And and he had, like, this crisis of confidence. He's talked about it a lot, but he did turn it around. And this is, like, one of the things that when people take a look back at uh, statistics for Hall of Fame quarterbacks, they're like, why is Terry Bradshaw in the Hall of Fame? Why is Joe Namath in the Hall of Fame? Well, because people are looking at their best years. And Terry Bradshaw's best years – were actually really phenomenal. Between 1977 and 1981, he actually led the league in cumulative adjusted net yards per attempt. And in two of those years, he actually led the league uh, in that category. Um, Contemporarily among same team guys, Troy Aikman, Josh Allen, two bad years and then a good year. Um, But yeah, guys who switched teams and then got better, not a ton. Geno Smith, a good one. Jeff George, a really good one, drafted first overall by the Mm -hmm. Colts. We know his time uh, with the Vikings, and also he did pretty well uh, with the Raiders. Vinny Testaverde, um, first overall pick for the Buccaneers in a strike season, which is kind of weird. Struggled a lot because of a heavy interception total. Never got rid of the interceptions, but started making a bunch of throws that that made those interceptions not matter as much. Same with Jake Plummer. Spent mm-hmm. several years in Arizona struggling. Jake, Jake the- Plummer. Yeah. Good, good name drop. Great. Name yeah, drop. And, and he was great for Denver. Um, yes. But in Arizona, he wasn't good. And then an interesting kind of example is Josh McCown, who I wouldn't characterize necessarily yeah. as a bust, but mm-hmm. he ended up throwing a bunch of passes for the Cardinals. What was he, like a fourth-round pick? Uh, early in his career and was just, like, not good and then stayed kind of not good until, like, 2013 when he had a fake offense in Chicago under Mark Tressman um, and was, like, a wow. league leader in a bunch of statistics and then turned that into a pretty good career as a startable quarterback for a while after that. So, and now he's that's on the right. Those Those are really, stuff. yeah, those yeah. are yeah. good ones. How, how about this one? What if I told you this guy played for the same team for 12 years, eight of those 12 years were losing seasons. So only four winning seasons out of 12, two of them are nine and seven years. So only hit double digit wins twice of those 12 years. He only was voted to a pro bowl one time. And then he gets traded and goes and wins the super bowl. Matt Stafford. Whew. Look at him go. Matt Stafford, who I think many would have considered a poor man's Kirk Cousins before the Super Bowl, I think. In in terms uh, of maybe in maybe in terms of quality, certainly not in terms of play style. Yeah, I mean Stafford Stafford didn't endure nearly the criticism that Cousins did, and he probably deserved more of it. Um personalities. I think we're super different. Stafford probably came across a little more, a little more likable because of the place he played. The standard was lower. He was kind of gritty. He was super, super tough minded quarterback and had like crazy arm strength. Yeah. Um, but, but the Super Bowls totally changed it with him. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but I, I find it interesting that all of the comps that Arif gave, those are older school, previous generation quarterbacks, because the threshold for being good at that point in time was just so much lower. The patience was so much more like the Vikings would tolerate quarterbacks like Sean Salisbury for multiple years. And they were fine with that because they just didn't expect as much. And now patience has gotten so thin that you're giving up on guys after two years, typically. And most of the time they're not given another opportunity, which is why oh, the Bakers Ari, Ari and Myrov, Geno's... Uh, Ari Myrov over at 33 Wait, do we need the sound? Just... Do we need the sound? No, no, no. This is not okay. a breaking news bit. Um, oh, okay. It's related oh. to what you just said. Um, just published a story about that, about the lack of patience for young quarterbacks and why GMs are moving on really quickly, despite the fact that we have uh, some contemporary examples like Josh Allen and arguably like Jordan Love, why GMs are moving on quickly. I haven't read the story yet, but um, he tends to be a little bit more of an aggregator. So his ability to kind of produce a genuine piece of journalism, I think is, is really cool and interesting. So I wanted to read that, um, but it was published really shortly before the show. So I didn't get time to read it, but that's, I think a, a pretty relevant consideration that actually a lot of people have noticed this, that they, they do move on from quarterbacks much more quickly. And that approach is supported by the data. Generally speaking, if you're not very good in a modern, um, system in your first two years it's actually really unlikely that you'll turn out to be good um and the fact that gms have not been seduced by josh allen's example i think is really fascinating uh let's get to the league meetings in a moment i also want to touch on the kickoff changes that that stemmed from that because i think that's super interesting and how will jp romo thrive as the vikings new kicker i'm so excited for him that's next on the minnesota football party Presented today by Game Time. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets, for goodness sake. You can get to all the best sports, all the best music, all the best comedy and theater in your area. You don't have to worry because you can get in last minute if you need. You can get in easily with just two taps. You can get in cheaply with all-in prices and a great promo code that'll give you in just a second. But with Zone Deals, you pick the section. Game Time picks the seats. Get big-time savings there. Uh, the game time guarantee means you get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section row for less, game time credits you 100%, uh, 110% of the difference. Game time's just giving you everything. So use game time. It's views from your seat. It's all in prices. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets. Download the game time app right now. Create an account. Use code locked on for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account. Redeem code locked on. L O C K E D O N for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Back on the Minnesota Football Party. Thank you for watching us live. You can also catch us on the 24 7 live stream here on Locked On Sports Minnesota, Amazon Fire, and Roku as well. Uh, a lot of good programming this week. Ron Johnson show. He had on the voice of the Wolves, Michael Grady, Minnesota Basketball Party on Wednesdays. And we got the round table typically on Fridays with Ron Johnson, Julia Daniels, and Reggie Wilson. Uh, let's talk league meetings. All the coaches uh, went down to Orlando and took a big group picture and talked about their contracts. And, oh, yeah, there were some press conferences and, and important rules meetings, too. And let's start Viking-centric. Any takeaways? Because O'Connell did the media junket. I mean, he talked to McAfee. He talked to another ESPN reporter. People, yeah. He talked to the VEN. He talked to the beat writers. So O'Connell did, like, two hours of interviews. Any takeaway quotes from KOC, Luke Inman? Not a ton, to be honest. You know, I think the big thing that I thought was kind of humorous and funny, I think they all got together in a big room before they left. All the bigwigs, KOC, Quasi, the Wills, they said, okay, what's the corporate buzzword or phrase going to be this year? What are we going to use? Competitive rebuild? Nope, already used that last year. Some intern probably yells out, flexibility. They all looked, <laughs> they nodded, they go, yep, let's go with flexibility. So every interview you watch, that's like the key word that's brought up so many times. And Obviously, you know, it matches what they've done. They've got the most flexibility now when it comes to any team outside the top five picks that can kind of wheel and deal, that can jump up to go get their guy if they want to. I think they've positioned themselves kind of ahead of the eight ball and kind of bullied their way in front of some teams that they knew potentially could pose a threat and beat them in a trade-up like Denver, obviously, maybe Vegas, et cetera. So 
yeah, you never know what's going to happen. Crazy stuff always goes down every draft. The Broncos could fall in love with J.J. McCarthy. They could give up uh, another King's ransom to get up to, let's say, four with Arizona, even though they don't have a second-round pick this year. Probably not likely. But the point is, they've given themselves, the Vikings, that is, the clearest path now. They've kind of stocked up the most ammo to kind of go into battle on draft night. And they've got the, you know, the high ground, so to speak, on the other teams and, and you know, that are looking to maybe move up for a quarterback flexibility. It means a lot of things, but I think at the end of the day, they've got a clearer path with not just plan a potentially moving up for a quarterback, but plan B and plan C, they should feel a lot better about as well. I think the game that they're forced to play is just so funny because with every question, <laughs> they have to seem so indifferent about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which yeah. they are not doing a good job of. That's my but, takeaway. They seem good, like good. super visibly giddy, top to bottom. O'Connell, Mark Wilf, like just grinning ear to ear when asked about what their plan is at quarterback, <laughs> whatever it is, whether that bears out to be correct or not, they are not doing a good job of hiding uh, the fact the that like smile I think they have KOC more King done than we know about. I guess when I'll McAfee uh, mentioned Michael Penix by name. KOC kind of like, and it could have been like, I know what you're doing, Pat. Yeah, I know like, what you're doing. Almost rolled his eyes. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That was pretty good. Um, the takeaway is not just that they want a quarterback. We know that it's that they've signaled that they're willing to pay for it, that they're willing yeah, to move sure. heaven and earth to get a quarterback, which is fun. It could be catastrophic, but it's fun that that's the case. I think maybe like some of the more, I don't know, subtle is the wrong word, but the more kind of varied takeaways are the fact that the defense last year was clearly a stopgap, that they're much more willing to engage in stuff like man coverage. That was part of the reason that they acquired Shaquille Griffin and that the defense will be a little bit more of a traditional blitz heavy defense, like the ones that we saw from Flores in Miami uh, and even in New England. So I think that that's kind of an interesting takeaway is that the defense is going to be a little bit different than it was last year, which is good because I think the defense got kind of exposed. It was really just like a, I don't know about gimmick, but like a band aid for what they had. So we'll see how that works. And then um, at some point they were asked about defensive tackle in the draft. And it's very clear that they wanted to acquire defensive tackle in free agency, obviously like beyond the likes of Jerry Tillery. Um, and I think, you know, there was reporting that they went after Christian Wilkins. So that yeah, it like, bears that. out. Um, but they talked about, you know, acquiring a defensive tackle in the draft. And I think that even though every GM would say, Hey, there's some good ones in this year's draft. I think that they signaled that, you know, should they have the draft capital to grab a DT, that would be one of their priorities. Um, I think that like signing someone like Shaquille Griffin may have reduced the urgency to grab a cornerback in the draft and now defensive tackle is closer to the top of their, their needs list. Yeah. I like some, some things that KOC says, I just can't possibly believe him when he, the first question he was asked in the long 35 minute session was about the DTs and just hearing him try to talk up Jerry Tillery and Jonathan Bullard. It just falls so flat that the answer <laughs> is obviously we're going to be adding pieces in the draft. Like he's trying to make Jaquel and Roy sound like Aaron Donald. And I'm just not, I'm not buying it at all. I thought that there were two secondary quotes that were fairly interesting too. one about Byron Murphy when talking about Griffin, he was speaking of Griffin with a lot of certainty that we're going to be playing him outside. This is going to let us move Byron Murphy inside more where he only played about 25% of his snaps in the slot last year. I think we expected him to play more than that. And there was just a lot of a lot of certainty in the way he spoke as if this was our plan for, all along. For a $6 million cornerback, which I like, that's a lot of certainty about a guy yeah. that you think is going to like, sure, man, you only, only paid $6 million for that guy then? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, he made it. Yeah. He's like, yeah, we've been looking to check every time he's been a free agent. And I'm like, all right, dude. All right. But <laughs> but that sounded it sounded like he, they've got a plan laid out, which, as we saw last year, like they made offseason plans very early that stuck like Josh Metellus was an offseason plan that they prepped all along. It wasn't something that popped up late in the game. They were like, we're going to do this. And they did it. And they also talked, or KOC also talked about playing Harrison Smith less, um, taking him off the field, 
like he played 98% of snaps last year. And KOC says, yeah, we're not going to do that again. We've got so much depth at safety. The first time I've really heard a coach talk about Harrison Smith as that much of an old man that needed that much management, but that was the vibe I got from his answer. I I may have gotten it confused, but I thought he also mentioned, maybe he also mentioned Harrison Phillips as well, but I may have gotten those, those two Harrisons confused, but yeah, both make sense because they both played a lot last year. Yeah. Um, but plenty, uh, plenty of good takeaways. Luke Braun, anything uh, that stood out to you? Nothing ab- uh, apart from what we've already talked about. It, it, it seems like the Viking. I mean, w- when the Vikings make a plan, they don't make a plan A and then nothing else, right? Like they have contingencies and all that, uh, and and all of the talk about flexibility is sort of driving at that to me. Uh, you know, is hey, we, we have this plan to trade up. Now we can do that. If we don't, we can do this. If that doesn't happen, we can do that. I, I think I, it just everything that we ever hear reaffirms the fact that I think on Thursday, you're going to be able to go to bed by pick five. Not bad. Not bad. And then Friday can just, uh, you, you know, don't even have nice to watch dinner. Yep. Yard work. Yeah, whatever <laughs> yeah. you want. Yard work, yeah. put in some yeah. family time, whatever you need to do. The, Friday. the days of, of Rick Spielman trading down three times at, you know, 11 p.m. Central. You don't have to be uh, you don't have to be angry about that. Old people who are still kind of ornery in the snow. Yeah, yeah. you're just saying you're just and we all know this, but you're just never going to get that many poker tells from these types of interviews and meetings just in general. Otherwise, that would mean, you know, they're not doing their jobs. They're not keeping their cards close to the vest. They're only doing themselves a disservice at that point. But uh, I think it goes without saying there is a lot more conversations happening behind the scenes with these coaches, with these GMs one on one that we're not a part of, especially this year in this class with so many QB needy teams and so many teams that are probably willing to move back like Arizona. It sounds like the Chargers as well. By the way, I mean, we've kind of kept it Viking centric here, but one of my biggest takeaways from all these coaches and and GM meetings and interviews that we heard Harbaugh is obsessed with the offensive line and as tempting as it would be. And as much sense as it makes on paper, if Marvin Harrison jr. Or Malik neighbors who a lot of people have, you know, within, you know, splitting, splitting hairs of each other prospect wise, if one of those guys fell in your lap, you would think it'd be a no brainer after you lose Mike Williams and Keenan Allen. But just from, Hearing everything he said, just when you know, listen to three to minute he's speech obsessed. on the importance of offensive linemen. Obsessed, even saying that defensive linemen are less important than offense, which is just correct. So fascinating. Yes, yeah, um, yeah. Because you know, he goes, "Well, don't you like it when the offense has a twelve minute drive, or right. excuse me, twelve play seven minute drive, and and the yeah. defensive line nods oh, their head? They go, okay. yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah." yeah. yeah. Um, so, that I, will, was I, I do want to, I do want to highlight the comment from TBD screen name, seen notably not mentioned by KOC at all when talking about uh, safety. Jay Ward even got a name drop. Yeah, it's, it's the end of Lewis Seen's, I think, career. Yeah, I think when Theo Jackson started getting snaps, we knew. That was, that was <laughs> yeah. it. That's when we knew. Yeah. Yeah. Like the bet- betting odds on him not being on the team, minus 130. I don't know if I go yeah, quite minus, I, but he's definitely on the bubble. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, that's he's, the thing, yeah. man. You're going to keep Theo again. That's four. You like Jay Ward. Obviously, in flexibility with Jay Ward, nickel, nickel cornerback. That's five. That's five. Yeah. Are we keeping six? Whoa. That's the end last year. Six last six. Right. No, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Well, it, um, it depends on what you need for the new kickoff. Right. Oh. It's true. Ooh. John Ooh. Parker Romo. I did some digging on JP Romo after the, the news broke of the new kickoff. This is how he fared in the XFL last year. So, so he had the highest return rate in the league, which means that his coach probably had that strategically targeted as we're going to try to to pin people. Um, So the highest return rate in the XFL, but the fifth lowest yards per return. So good at hitting the target landing zone, but good at reducing returns thanks to an above average hang time. So I'm all in. I'm all in on JP Romo. Does hang time matter if you're not allowed to move until the ball hits the ground? Hmm. Good point. I, fair, I don't think hang time point. matters. The um, only thing I could think of is that maybe it's more difficult to judge in windy conditions the higher up it goes. But you're right; like that's sure. kind of a obsolete um, point now at this point. 
Yes, you're uh, right. So Sheen says J.P. Romo is definitely a cursed name. I was so curious about this. So J.P. Lossman and Tony Romo both debuted in the NFL in 2004. I just thought that that J.P. Wow. Lossman. J.P. Lossman. Uh, <laughs> Great name. But yeah, some good uh, name drops today. Yeah, uh, I I am really curious about the kickoff because I think it's like these considerations that aren't immediately intuitive. That like because I. I think if you had asked me like 10 minutes ago about hang time, I would have thought, yeah, that sounds important. And then I just remembered that particular part of the rule. No, yeah, right? you're right. There's like Doesn't just matter. a bunch of small things that are going to change. There was a really good thread by Eric Galco who helped run the XFL's uh, personnel department um, in like conjunction with like running the Shrine Bowl. And at the time he owned Optimum Scouting. Um, and he mentioned that it changes the personnel requirements because um when you have like these like graduated moves of, of players across the field, which now for people who are unfamiliar, all of the players in kickoff block will be in the same like 10 yard window of the field. Um, when that wasn't the case, you'd have a bunch of different body types, right? You'd have a bunch of running backs right ahead of the returner. Then you'd have the returner, which is often a receiver or a cornerback type, sometimes a running back. Uh, and then as you get closer to the line, the more they were like linebacker body types, right? Um, now everybody is closer to the line. So you might see more linebacker body types. So when we're asking that question about like, hey, are they going to carry a sixth safety? They might not because you might want a bigger body there um, just because of the nature of the way that those blocks will play out. The, the fact that you've got less of a run up, the fact that you're not going to have an up back do returns in your stead. Right. Like that was one of the reasons that you would have running backs back there is that they might have to field the ball. So, you know, that's going to change the way the bottom of the roster shakes out because you want, you know, guys that can block there or guys that can beat those blocks uh, from a short run up. Um, so it, it's going to be kind of fascinating. Um, they uh, quibbled a little bit about where the touchback range was. And this is kind of interesting, too, is that there's mm -hmm. two dueling incentives here. Right. Is that if the touchback is further back like say 2025 20, at the 25 yard line um you're more likely gonna want to sky it out the back of the end zone as a kicker but if it's further up right the 35 40 yard line well not 40 but you know as an example mm -hmm. the more likely the kicker is gonna want to down it for a touchback and so you have to find the sweet spot and they did change it from i believe the 35 to the 30 if i remember correctly yep. Yep. in order to see if they can ma manufacture a good sweet spot to maximize the number of returns, which I think is really cool. I think a lot of people responded to the new kickoff rule changes by saying, ah, we're, this kills the play. There's not going to be any returns, which first of all, there haven't been any returns. Where have you been? But second, um, the data in the XFL tells us that this reduces injury rates, increases the number of returns, and increases the likelihood of a big return. So it feels like the best of all worlds. There's one more note I want to add. In Eric Elko's thread, he said it changes the type of returner that you're going to get. You're going to more likely want a running back type guy that's pretty good at one cut type running uh, as if it were zone blocking in a run. I'm kind of curious about that, if that's how that plays out. It seems like that's how it played out over two years. Oh, you mean like how the Steelers signed Cordero Patterson the day after this rule got implemented? Uh, it, that, that doesn't count. Okay. Uh, Cordero Patterson is just insanely good. It doesn't matter. Right, doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> <You don't. laughs> I don't care. But the other returners, the other 31, um, it might be that like Keyshawn Nixon for the Packers is not going to be nearly as deadly potentially, right? Mm. It might be that. Well, I just would presume that Kenny Wong was like a good running back, which I suppose he's not. But it might be that he's a much better fit for this kind of return, even yeah. though he's already a really good returner when he was it, a rookie, Yeah, so. I, I and it's not a run. It doesn't. It's still not as fast as a running play. A running play, you have to have that thing halfway read out by the time you get the ball. Like you still have ten yards of runway. That never happens on a from scrimmage running play. So yeah, so I'm kind of curious. It's still to see how closer that to the old kickoff in terms out. of like how much it takes you to read it. Uh, so I'm not worried about like Wong who's suddenly not being able to read blocks like uh, somebody mm -hmm. said in the chat. But uh, yeah, if you're not used to at least trying to read out a run play quickly, uh, like if, if you're the slowest run play reader in the world, you can still probably read this kickoff. But if you're if you just can't read a run play at all because you're not a running back, then maybe you'd have a problem. Yeah, no, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Sam, just to circle back, you did mention Quasi sometimes, and KOC for that matter, sometimes 
kind of a, a ahead of the curve or ahead of the game plan as far as like Josh Metellus signing, you know, before. And then mm -hmm. we saw all these safeties, what happened in the safety market. Signing Romo three, four weeks before this rule change feels mm -hmm. like that falls under that same umbrella as well. But um, yeah. yeah, it's going to be interesting, man. I, I personally haven't watched as much XFL as you guys. Obviously, I've seen the replays, what it's going to look like. It's probably going to take some time for, you know, the average fan to get used to because it does look very different visually from what we've watched our entire lives, literally. But end of the day here, obviously, eliminating that violent car crash impact every time, I'm sure we're going to see a lot less injuries, long-term effects, you know, three, four, five years down the road. So, uh, I'm I'm kind of excited about it to be honest. I don't know if people are just kind of on the fence about it. They like it. What like where the majority lies? But I'm kind of excited about it. Yeah, yeah. The strategic element is, is just so, like I because I honestly don't have an opinion yet on what I would do. Like if you're mm -hmm. up by three, yeah. and there's 40 seconds left in the game, what do you do? Do you give it to him at the 30, or do you tempt fate and kick the ball short? Like I don't know. I don't know yet what I would do. Um, do you pot like, is there going to be like a skill to popping it up pooch style and land it like right at the 20 yard line? So you're, so there's not a lot of run up. I don't know yet. That's, what's going to be really fun to, uh, to see like which team hacks it and has three kickoff returns in the first four weeks, um, taking advantage of sort of the, the varying degrees of strategy that will surround this play. Um, it so that's would be cool about super it. funny if they had adopted the other portion of the XFL kickoff, which is that they get to run a fourth and 15 play. I know. Um, oh, yeah. Up, up yeah, because it kills the onside I'm kick. A, I hope that's yeah. yeah. Up by three, 40 seconds left. Just run around a little bit on fourth and 15. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's super funny. I think in the XFL, you can only do it when you're behind, right? Oh, no, you're right. You can't only do it when you're behind. God, that would have been so funny. Oh, that would have been but, perfect. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, and so for people who are unfamiliar with the rule change, um, you can declare an onside kick in the fourth quarter. You can say, hey, we're uh, choosing to, to onside kick, in which case the old kickoff rules apply, but I think you are required to like kick it short and stuff like that. So um, you can do an onside kick in this scenario, and you don't have the run-up rules or whatever. It's just the normal kickoff rules, but it has to be an onside kick attempt. Um, quick pause, and then we'll take some fan questions after this on the Minnesota Football Party. No sign of Ron Johnson yet. Could be because he's uh, he's putting together his parlay for March Madness this weekend <laughs> on FanDuel. Say goodbye to your busted brackets uh, because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the NCAA tournament, whether you're betting on the upset or you're riding the one seed to victory. It's time to go dancing with America's number one sportsbook. New customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. Find a good money line, win that $5 bet, and uh, get $200 in bonus bets to put on point spreads, money lines, future champions. You got NHL. You got college hockey playoffs starting today. FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Bet college hoops until they cut down the nets at FanDuel. Make every moment more. Um, good opportunity to talk about the Jaden Daniels screenshot of the elbow. I assume we all saw that. Um, and we got a question yeah, too. Extremely um, funny. Does Daniels pro day impact your thoughts on the desire of Washington or new England to move down? Are people really using the photo as arsenal that the elbow is, no, 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 is no. diseased the, in some way? Okay. Some, what, people what's the deal with suggested, the some people suggested that he had a bad pro day. I think, primarily the people I've been seeing talk about it weren't there. So I don't really care. And also it's a pro day. Um, so it's like two elements of me not caring about it. Um, but no, the picture is very funny. So if you haven't seen it, I think I bet if you Google Jade Daniels picture elbow, it's, it's you'll find wild. It. Is what um, it's crazy. someone. So, so it's originally, I think it's like an, what is it? An Adam Schefter tweet with that picture attached to it. Something like that. One of the breaking news guys uh, tweeted out something about Jaden Daniels. That picture is attached to it. In the replies is someone who purports to be a medical professional. I haven't checked to see if they are, so I'm going to be careful here. And they say it's actually not a reason to worry, and it, it likely is a combination of like the weird speed at which photos are taken and how quickly you have to move your arm in a throw like that, plus uh, per perhaps a, a bursar sack. Um, 
impact that bursitis in- is, is yeah. that the word i saw yeah 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 it, which uh doesn't cause pain it doesn't have any long-term um problems it's just if you bang your elbow it might fill with fluid um and so it could potentially be an infection risk but in this case it wasn't so not a huge deal very interesting funny photo um but it sounded like some people thought that his pro day wasn't very good i guess in throws five of his passes hit the ground um one of which was a drop I don't know which passes they were or why they hit the ground, so I can't really use that to mean much. Um, but uh, he threw the ball pretty far, which is pretty cool. I like that. I'm looking reaction. at the the throws from under center right now that somebody cut up on Twitter. It looks fine. I don't know what people are mad about. Uh, here's what I want people to do. Look at the Jaden Daniels throws in the pro day and watch his feet, and then go look at the Joe Milton one that everybody like freaked out <laughs> over and then watch his feet. And you tell me which one looks more like an NFL athlete. <laughs> oh, uh, but uh, j- hold on. Joe Milton rules is the difference here. Uh, that's yes. Important. Yeah. Super cool. If the job of quarterback was being a jugs machine on a tripod. Oh, I don't care about the job of quarterback. Are you kidding? me? Oh, OK, no. cool. That's yeah, th- that, that's clear as evidenced by your Joe Milton take. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when he throws the ball far. That's it. I, <laughs> That's, well, good thing you don't expect anything else. <laughs> yeah. I think he should play tight end in the NFL. I love <laughs> reverse <laughs> trick hey, play. Taysom, Taysom Hill manages yeah, Taysom. Uh, to throw the football with terrible technique as well. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. No, that's true. Yeah. I, I really just in general, though, Sam, don't take a lot out of these pro days again. I mean, these scouts have been watching these these players sometimes for years and, and ultimately the pro day. And, and again, it's rehearsed. It's scripted. You expect them to go out there and be close to flawless or look pretty perfect. But, you know, as we've learned in the past, the Johnny Manziel coming out in the full pad, Zach Wilson throwing the viral bomb that we saw. It just really doesn't matter that much at the end of the day. It is information. We'll take as much information as we can. We'll pull it together. We'll make an assessment from that information. But at the end of the day, it's just kind of small potatoes compared to actual game film and the human element of actually meeting these guys in those team interviews as well. So I didn't watch the uh, the entire pro day. Um, I did hear what Arif mentioned. Some people weren't in love with it, but I'll have to go back and watch and make my own assessment. But uh, regardless, whatever my assessment is after watching it, it's going to be a, a again kind of minuscule as far as you know what that does to his evaluation. Common man two five five. What are y'all's most confident take on a specific QB at this point? Let's revisit on uh, April twenty sixth. So is it that Joe Milton is QB one in the class? Is that it? <laughs> no, but I, I did say a month ago Joe Milton has the strongest arm I've ever seen. Better than Josh Allen. Just strong. He's not a good quarterback. Let's not argue that. He's not a good quarterback. Yeah, yeah. But but just str- it's just what, fun. It is funny. What, I get is he get, what a reset. It's cool. He, it's is, funny. Is somebody gonna spend a draft pick on on this arm? Uh yeah, somebody Oh is. yeah. Yeah. Um first and I say, round, oh no. yeah, like Second oh round, yeah, probably uh, not. day three for sure. But, but but yeah, um so I mean so the question asks us to revisit this on April 26th, which suggests to me this is a draft take and not like an outcome take. So we can't be like, hey. Um, I actually think Spencer Rattler is the best quarterback in the class or whatever. We're not going to know that on April 26th. So instead, um, I'm just going to stick with Spencer Rattler because that's been like a topic of conversation online. Um, I think he'll go in the second round. I think he'll go a lot higher than oh. than uh, had been anticipated in January, just based off of the conversations everyone seems to be having about him. I was able to watch a little bit of it. I was kind of impressed. Um, so, yeah, um, Spencer Rattler. Round two guy. Somebody asked in the pick. last show, they said, how high is too high to take Spencer Rattler? So for Arif, your, your answer would be first round. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So is, he, is he a date? Is Here's the thing that it sounds like people are starting to consider is having him over like Penix and Knicks, even though most of the discussion has been as those two guys as five and six, like pretty cleanly. Uh, I'm not there. I, maybe when Knicks, I watch him, maybe. I enjoy I, watching there, him more than I enjoy watching Knicks. And when I think about his NFL future, I feel happier than what I think about Penix's NFL future. That doesn't mean I think either of them are worse prospects than him. Right. I just think like analytically, you you sit down and you break it apart. You take a look at what are the things that you think make a good prospect. I would still take those two over him. I just, 
enjoy him more mm -hmm. <laughs> if that makes sense hey can so, i throw out a uh, i heard a, a fun trade scenario i want to say it was on nine to noon pa don't quote me on that can't remember but i wrote it down i just want you guys to like rank it one to ten rate it if you okay. like it or, or don't like it it was moving up with arizona who remember has picks four and 27 and it was picks 11 pick 23 and next year's first for arizona's pick four and 27 you guys like that rank it one to ten what do you think yeah, it was too many numbers. I lost track. So it's, it's just three first round first picks for get, four and twenty seven. They move up feels like a curve. down twenty three okay. to twenty seven. And you uh, it depends on who's available. Of yeah. course, yeah, it depends on how the board. Falls. I mean, it's, if it's they, if it's to four, it's for, it's for JJ McCarthy. Like, JJ almost, it, certainly, it right? probably is for JJ McCarthy. Yeah, but it is still possible that like New England is like ah, Marvin Harrison, right? Like it's still <laughs> yeah. Possible. Yeah. I, I, get, or, I don't think that that if, if they don't trade down, I don't think so. The, I don't, the, this is my most confident QB take for whoever asked right now is that JJ McCarthy is going fourth and that QBs are going one, two, three. That my most confident all the other QB stuff take, is smoke. Don't don't overthink that. Mine is that Washington is not going to trade out of the pick. Are they stupid? They're not going to trade out of the pick. The command is stupid. Yeah. yeah, hold on. Think about this. <laughs> Careful, for a second, bud. Sam. Kinda. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no okay, so I mean, but there's a logic to it, and New England spelled out the logic, which is that um, if you draft a quarterback and put him in an awful environment, you might have just wasted your quarterback pick. I'm not saying the logic is correct. I think that you should get the best available guy with the best opportunity you have, and at the second overall pick, that's likely the best opportunity you're going to get for a while. I don't agree with the logic, but I do think there is a logic to it. There's a reason yeah. behind it that is somewhat sound that you can tease out. And, and that is that you need to build a team the, uh, the Washington doesn't have an offensive line. Right. And so they don't want to put that quarterback potentially. Yeah, did, into Houston that they do, team, they, though? did Houston they, have a team? The, when they they, damn, I'm not saying I agree with it. Yeah. I'm so, saying I, that I know, a lot of I know. teams. Yeah. Um, and Houston actually did have a pretty good offensive line. And that receiving group was quite nice, it turns out. Yeah, so. and and Washington does have six picks in the top 92. So I agree with you. The ecosystem matters a lot for quarterbacks. Look at David Carr, the most sacked quarterback in, in NFL history. What, two out of the top three years ever, I think he, he ranks? Um, yeah, it matters quite a bit. I think there is enough offensive line talent where you could go get some guys later on. But again, every draft's different. Um, wide receiver, super deep as well. So again, going back to like the Chargers, for example, Harbaugh's obsessed with offensive line. Everybody says, how are you going to pass on neighbors or Marvin Harrison at five? Maybe they take offensive line, go get a Lad McConkey or whoever it may be, because that's where the strength is in this draft class. So yeah, it all depends on how those first few picks shakes out. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Hoops talk in the chat said, am I dumb for saying I want Daniels the least? No, uh, it, I like Daniels a lot. Like, I don't think I would agree with you, but like, it's the draft, I don't, I, especially yeah, and, with, with like these top three guys or there's these kind of second three guys after Caleb Williams. There are a lot of differing opinions. Some takes get hotter than others, but just like put that in the back of your mind and watch how Dan, if Jaden Daniels turns out really, really, really well. And it turns out that you were wrong. Interrogate why yeah, you thought I, that and see if you can learn something. Yeah, I don't I don't think especially for somebody with a risk profile like Daniels, I don't think it would it would. It, it, is unreasonable to be extremely hesitant about this guy, right? There's a lot of reasons that that risk profile is worrisome. Whether you're not confident about his ability to operate in a timing offense, whether you're concerned about his ability to keep his eyes up when he's scrambling, whether you're concerned about uh, how many hits he takes, especially given his frame, a lot of reasons to be concerned. Um, and, and wanting him the least, I think, is one of the reactions that you could have given the very mm -hmm. different profiles for all of these quarterbacks. I like him though. I like him too. Um, I, I want to close with just a moment of appreciation for the Vikings ownership group that as we watch the Timberwolves sail fall through and Glenn Taylor again, just <laughs> bungle a situation. Um, let's just pause and reflect appreciatively that the Vikings have owners that know what the heck they're doing. Um, and can you imagine, like, j just think about this, like, think about letting a minority group of that profile getting in your building and then leading them on for three years 
and sitting across the table from them for three years and sitting courtside with them for three years. Like imagine the Wilfs brought in an ownership group, like, I don't know, Jay-Z and LeBron and had them in the suite with them. And then at the last moment, pulled the rug out and said, nope, we're keeping the team. Like It that's is very happening. funny that, that Sam led with imagine letting a minority in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, okay, so here's what I think Glenn Taylor is uh, probably attempting to do. Again, I don't know anything about basketball. I think, and we discussed this before the show, and I think it's basically your idea that I'm stealing and reappropriating Sam, which is that the value of the franchise is going up and they don't want to sell uh, the remaining shares of the franchise at the previous price, right? Yesterday's price is not today's price type stuff, right? So yeah, I think awesome. that is probably it obviously there had to be a contract specific way to do it and missing out on some payments which seems to be what um a rod's group was doing is a way to get out of it and you could have extended it and not been so strict but the strictness i think is motivated by the fact that the sale price has gone up and saying stuff like the timberwolves are not for sale is just a, a way to posture as opposed to genuine finality towards uh what the timberwolves mm -hmm. are so Timberwolves, uh, what are they, second right now in the division, right? Second in the um, yep, second place in the West. Yep. Uh, in the West. Oh, he's the conference. Um, so uh, really, really fantastic playoff opportunity ahead of them. Um, with that in mind, that the value of the franchise goes up, especially the, given the contracts for uh, Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns, especially once he comes back from injury. So, hey um the price of the franchise goes up so we're not going to use the previous sale price we're going to leverage it for another one i think that's what he is doing i don't know if that's a good or a bad idea there's a reason that you want to maintain relationships with people that you're doing business with that might seem like bad business on paper and as good business in practice but that is i think the attempt here so so this and i think you're right good analysis and listen to the minnesota basketball party on wednesdays for more of this and the postcast with luke inman and jack borman but if the Wolves suddenly refuse to pay the luxury tax next year, because the, the roster is going to be crazy expensive. And I think there was some thinking that an ownership led by Lori and A-Rod would be willing to go into a little bit of, of salary cap debt to pay this, like to keep this championship window open. And if suddenly that doesn't happen with Taylor calling the, the final shot, that's going to be really frustrating. Um, if the, if yeah, their ideologies are that, is yeah. that where this is headed? I don't follow this, the wolves like at all. Is that, but is that where this is headed? They finally have a good season and then the owner is going to cheap out and say, I changed my mind. I changed my mind. Not only am I not, am I not selling because I think this is too valuable a team, but also I'm not going to put money into it and make this less valuable of a team. It, it God, is that possible rules. that that happens. Oh my Feels God. Like, Feels like, holy goodness. crap. That is amazing. Yeah, I like this, the Wolves. This would be the guy to do it if somebody <laughs> yeah. was going to do it. This would be yeah. the guy. I mean, like, I don't like any billionaires, but relatively speaking, yeah, the Wolves are pretty good in the context of owning a sports team. That's pretty nice. The, Correct. the crimes Agreed. they are accused of are all white collar. We got to take that. Yeah, they're hurting <laughs> other billionaires a lot. And honestly, uh, we love a good class trade. We're here for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, we are... Before before yeah, we're done here, right real quick, I want to shout out. Uh, I don't, uh, Macho Meach, I don't want you to feel ignored. He asked me to dab. Uh, you got to make it worth my while, and it's up to you to figure out what that means. Ooh, <laughs> tune in Monday. <laughs> tune in Monday to, to catch the, the conclusion of Braun the price versus Price of Macho. a dab. What is the price of a dab? That's on you. What's street challenge nowadays? Huh? We're What's live Mondays and Thursdays on Lockdown Sports Minnesota about 11 a.m. Uh, and we've also got plenty of other great programming here at Locked On Sports Minnesota. Find audio of this show at Locked On Vikings podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. For Luke, Luke Arif, I'm Sam Ekstrom. Thanks so much for tuning in today. We appreciate you, and we'll talk to you next week.